Hello, Ella. Hi. It's so nice to be here. I feel like we have a lot, a lot, a lot of ground to cover. I'm almost laughing to myself because I just want to say wow. Can we just say wow, well done. What a few years you've had. It's intense, right? It has been amazing. But yes, yeah, certainly like we've not seen each other yeah. since pre-COVID. COVID. Pre various children. Yeah, because you just had, I met Sky. Yeah. Um, I wasn't pregnant. I remember messaging you when I was pregnant. Exactly. But yeah, you sent me that lovely care package in lockdown. It was so sweet. Yeah, it's such been a, a long time. time. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So it's been, yeah. Um, yeah, it's been a roller coaster few years, as I'm sure it has for a lot of people. It has. And I, I think um, let's start away from the um, COVID side of things, but let's discuss the fact that Delicious Yella is a household name. You've got the biggest plant based business in the UK. And when I say that, how does that make you feel? I have this like really instinctive reaction to laugh. I'm yeah. like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> this is still like a pet project that I'm doing in my parents' kitchen. And it's funny because you spend all, you know, I spend all day in the office. We're just down the road from here. And like, I love it so much. It's funny you had that kind of first day back today. It was the first day our office was open when we were recording. And yesterday I had that like, oh God, do I want to go back to school sort of feeling. And I'll be back in the office today. And I'm like, oh, I love this so much. Yeah. Um, but you sort of forget, I think, the growth that, yeah, that we've been on. And it's it's been very difficult few years at some at points. But I had this crazy stat from one of the team when I asked them oh how many products have we sold since we launched and it's now over 90 million <gasps> and oh. yeah you just sort of hear those sorts of things and you think sorry what and well again, I contribute to some of those numbers <laughs> thank you yeah this is our seventh cookbook and yeah it says on the front like 1.5 million copies sold and you just I don't know it really it baffles me and um I just can't quite yeah. believe it. Well, it, I mean, it's hard to ever decompress those huge values and numbers and put them into something that is logical because your brain's probably this, an element, I'm guessing, of maybe what people talk about imposter syndrome a little bit as well and managing a family life. You've got a business and a family life and I'm guessing it doesn't leave much room for anything else, really. Oh, my gosh, no room for anything else. But, yeah, I mean, um, I think... I feel like I understand the imposter syndrome a little bit better almost now. I feel I've kind of come to terms with it a little bit, whereas actually if I look back at the last decade or so, particularly the beginning of my career, I mean, the extent to which I felt that was absolutely extraordinary. Um, And I know it's so common for women and something I think we probably can't talk about enough because I think in normalising it and realising other people feel that way too, It does give you that sense of confidence that, you know, it's okay. Um, But yes, especially the first few years of my career, I felt so uncomfortable and nervous and really didn't, I think I didn't enjoy a lot of Mm. what I was doing and a lot of what was happening because I felt really anxious in the vulnerability of putting myself out there and it's more sort of post kids, I think, really, and like thinking about the sort of role model I want to be for, especially having two young girls. And in that, I think having a little bit more self confidence. And actually, I found COVID um, challenging in lots of ways, but it gave a lot of time for reflection, which I think because my career had been so fast and it taken completely over my life coupled with lots of complicated things happening on a personal level within my family and, and my mm. husband's family. I think I just hadn't stopped. I feel like I hadn't sat down and breathed for seven years or so. It was like living on times 30, you know, when you fast forward something. And so it was quite reflective. And I think I really realised how much I'd had these amazing opportunities and these amazing experiences and actually hadn't enjoyed a lot of them and hadn't. And actually there was a lot to be proud of, but I'd never let myself be proud of it because I felt being proud of it made me arrogant. And I was already knew lots of people didn't like me. And, you know, that would make me even worse and all the rest of it. It's the scrutiny uh, that you get when you're in the spotlight. I think that's part of it, isn't it? It's the um, constant critiquing, the constant pressure to be something that I think everyone wants you to be as well. Because I'm sure that people just think you 
live and breathe, which to, to a degree you do, deliciously Ella, but you are so much more than that as a person. And it's actually the graft. I think what you've described so perfectly is the graft that it takes to get to the level where you are now. It doesn't just happen overnight. And I think it's very easy for onlookers to look on, especially on social platforms and think, oh, wow, you know, 90, 90 million is a huge, amazing number. Oh, that's just because she's got a following on XYZ. No, it's because you are a business owner and a mother and you're able to put all those hours in and you don't just fob it off to somebody else. You are working hard. Yeah, no, I think there is definitely an element of that. And I think it's... Uh... It's an interesting lesson, isn't it, in realising that people have a lot of opinions on you. And I think, again, that's taken a really long time to feel really comfortable with. Yeah. And I, I don't know what your experience was like, but I certainly felt there's a moment of actually, I almost didn't want to say anything anymore because I was so conscious of, and actually in retrospect, it was a very small number of people, but that real very vocal minority of people who don't agree with you or don't like something you do and I've always felt so strongly that you should divide criticism into two categories mm -hmm. one of which is constructive criticism and it's really helpful yeah. and like even if it's not delivered in the nicest way there's still a lot to take when people think you could do something better both in your personal life and your professional life and actually you can always be a better parent a better mother a better friend a better business owner all the rest of it like yeah, there's always room for growth yeah no but as in taking that that criticism on board and actually using it to mm -hmm. fuel growth in yeah. in your kind of mindset and the way that you do things and then criticism of criticism's sake which is ultimately like I hate your voice you look really ugly <laughs> you look <laughs> you look too fat you look too thin you look too this you, you look, look so too old that. now they say yes. it all <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah. exactly you look tired yeah. yeah yeah I've just been up with the kids all night <laughs> exactly and so it was learning really quickly to try and divide it into those two camps and to be okay one of which is this hasn't resonated with you and we can do better and one is actually I'm just not going to get involved in that and I'm not going to I used to read everything and get super mm -hmm. like affected by it and I, I think I, what I realised was then when I took a step back actually like over the last 10 years we've helped you know we've talked to millions and millions of people and helped shift the mindset of putting plants oh, yeah. at the centre of the way that people think about their food it's not about making everyone go plant-based but it's about showing people like cooking with plants first a plant-rich diet can actually be really delicious obviously it's got loads of health benefits when you're putting broccoli and lentils etc mm -hmm. at the forefront of the way that you're eating and we've heard story after story of people you know to whom that's made a massive difference to their life because it's had a massive difference to their health and obviously that has huge repercussions to your whole life you know not just the way you feel every single day and actually it felt like the biggest missed opportunity not to say anything for fear that what you say isn't right for one person. And I think that's been one of my best realisations. And in really feeling that and genuinely feeling that, I feel so much more yeah. comfortable and empowered to actually say, no, I, I really want to make a difference to people's lives. And it's not going to resonate with everyone. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely fine. But when you hear that one person to whom it's really changed mm -hmm. their life, that makes everything so extraordinarily worthwhile. I love that. And I, I think it goes to show, first of all, I will say it because I know you wouldn't say it about yourself, but I, I think you pioneered the way for the enthusiasm around plant-based foods. You absolutely reshaped the way that we see food, the way we cook food. And that's a credit to your books. You know, I've got a copy in front of me of Healthy Made Simple and the recipes are delicious. You know, the chocolate cookies you do at home with the kids, the freezer ones, I do that with mine. Um, you've, oh, you've got pictures of the girls in there. Which yeah, they I absolutely loved doing adore. the book. I bet they did. But, you know, it. we're going to get on to the book in a minute, but it's a credit to you, Ella, because there were a lot of crit critics out there at the time. And I hate to say it, a lot of them in my profession, which were, I get them too, just, you know, hands up there. I have the same critics pummeling down on me whenever I say anything about plant-based nutrition as well. But I think the definition of plant-based and how you view it and what you do with it is widely misunderstood. And it's about making plants the centre of attention. Let's just get them in. Because I think for far too long, it's just been pushed aside. You know, it's 
spoiled. It's looked at as this terrible thing that your grandma used to make you drink the juice up at the bottom. But it doesn't have to be like that, does it? No, and that's the whole point. And I think it's funny, I got in trouble really early in my career for saying that. And I did not say it right. And obviously, if I was doing the same interview now, I would rephrase it. But I said, oh, I don't like vegans. And obviously, that's not... I don't remember you saying that. No, it's not what I meant. And I just can't can't highlight that enough. But what I was trying to say, I have utmost respect for anyone who follows a fully vegan lifestyle. Yeah. What I was trying to say was, I hate this idea that we're trying to say to people, it has to be all or nothing. Yeah. And we lose so much nuance in the way that we talk today in clickbait headlines, in social media posts, because ultimately nuance isn't that interesting. You know, what's really interesting is things that are kind of juicy and like quite um, out there. Yeah. And as a result, I think talking about make this work for you. This is what works for me, but it'll be different for you. You've got to find the balance that suits you. It's it's quite boring compared to the it extreme is. things. And I think as a result, that messaging gets really lost. And, you know, the aim has always been to change the preconceptions around cooking a plant first yeah. diet. And it's not about trying to say everyone should go plant based. I actually, you know, somewhat controversially to some people don't believe that because I don't think that that is the right thing for most people because the right thing for you is something that you enjoy and something that feels feasible and something that most importantly feels sustainable it's not about doing something for six weeks it's not about doing something even for six months it's thinking about what are my habits that I can start today Mm -hmm. that I could still be doing 10 years from now and if those habits don't feel like something you could be doing from 10 years from now they're probably not really the right things to do to change your health and I think that's the conversation that I wish we could have more often and to bring in that more balanced, nuanced approach, which is like, yes, we all need to eat more vegetables. There was this, I'm sure you saw it, I think it was at the weekend, a report came out showing, oh, the Brits are doing really well. We now eat, 33% of us now eat our five a day. (laughs) And now I think that's up from about 27%. It's 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 the National Diet and Nutrition Survey. So it's up a few percent and that's amazing. That's great. Obviously this you know, what's happened in the last yeah. decade of putting, you know, not not just us, but across the board, putting plant-based recipes out there, really highlighting how delicious these vegetables can be when they're not boiled, to your point, is, you know, there's a bit of it that's working and that is amazing. But my God, we've got a long way to go. 33%. Like, exactly. It's, it's it is, not really a cause no. for celebration, <laughs> fundamentally. <laughs> Um, especially when we see, you know, the challenge that the rise in lifestyle related diseases is having on the NHS. And, you know, so it's it's an interesting one because yeah. we do need to show people that broccoli isn't doesn't need to be boiled and it can be so delicious. And there's so many great things you can do with it that will make you, your family, your loved ones, everyone actually want to eat it. But by the way, you don't have to only eat broccoli forevermore. And this is the message that gets lost. Yes. Let's touch on these messaging. So we said at the beginning of the podcast, we were going to kind of go into it very quickly. We don't see the nuance. I know I've, I've fallen victim to it recently. I've given some normal evidence-based advice about seed oils, but there's a lot of misinformation on the internet. But instead of communicating with each other in a, I don't want to say a grown-up way, but instead of just discussing, oh, I don't understand when I've heard X, Y, Z that this could be true, people tend to get attacked online these days and you don't get a whole clear picture. And like you said, there's different camps. And what's making it so confusing for everyone at the moment is people are very confidently... um, saying one size fits all you know they and I love what you've just done Ella by saying it's not going to be for everyone but what we can do is show them that every now and get and again these meals are actually very beneficial for their health you know we've got concrete evidence and tons of randomized control trials and whatever you want to quote at me scientific literature to suggest eating plants can help your lifespan you've got blue zone data now which is fascinating you know looking at all of that eating beans pulses legumes we know this Why and how do you deal with these aggressive online, I'm going to call them aggressive because I've been victim to it. And I love what you said about learning now in your career to walk away. It's so true. If you just leave it for a day or two, it kind of vanishes amazingly. But there's a lot, they're angry. How do you deal with the anger? I think the thing for me that just feels like, for want of a better expression, just such a shame, is I feel like ultimately we're all just collectively missing the point. The Our kind of standard Western diet is so far from a healthy diet and 
we so desperately need to change that and to help everybody move closer towards mm. a healthier diet, much yeah. more back to how our grandparents used to eat. And yeah. that includes eating loads and loads of vegetables. And you said we see that in the blue zones and all around mm. the world. Now, to what extent you want to be more pescatarian, more carnivore, like these yeah. are personal decisions. I think what get, what's frustrating is like ultimately what what we end up doing is just creating this huge amount of confusion for people. And there's this, I say it all the time, like never let perfect be the enemy of good. And I think because people Love don't that. know what perfect is, it's almost like yeah. everything is so confusing. Now, should I do this or should I do that? Should I eat this or should I do that? It feels very tribal. Yeah, it does. As tribal. opposed to like, do you know what? Let's just eat less ultra processed food. Let's not have about two thirds of our diet come from ultra processed mm-hmm. food. Let's eat more lentils. Let's eat more broccoli. Let's put these simple, old fashioned, for want of a better word, foods yeah. back in the centre of our play. And if we were all doing that, then let's argue over the nuance. I know. But it just feels like we are, We've lost as the a plot. total society, yeah, so far away from eating in a way that is genuinely beneficial for our health. And the planet, Ella. Like, I will say that the environment, we need to be eating more plants to save the environment. There, You cannot dispute anyone listening. You cannot dispute the information we have that states that, you know, greenhouse gas emissions are... are huge contribution factor is agriculture and that's the thing and i think this it's hard not to feel frustrated at points when people are saying well it doesn't matter like don't tell people what to do and it's not about telling people what to do but i think there is a certain moment and i I really understand because food is a very emotive topic and talking about the way that we eat and then beyond that Mm. the way we maybe cook for other people is cost of living crisis exactly and you know the level of juggle that people have in their lives like it's so complicated and I don't want to kind of be too reductionist in the way that I talk about it but equally it just it is important to be frank about the fact that the standard western diet doesn't benefit our health Mm. and we do need to change that and there are ways to, you know, like lessen your likelihood of getting all of the common diseases, essentially. Yeah. And ultimately, like, we, I think that we're not very honest with people about that because it's such a complicated topic and then people say, don't tell me what to do. And we just end up in this kind of quagmire where you've got tribal camps who are all actually essentially eating really well, fighting with each other. And then everybody else just really confused. And as a result, we're fundamentally not collectively having the impact that we should have and ultimately like I still think that Michael Pollan quote of eat food not too much mostly plants yeah is actually like the most genius (laughs) yeah it's just the best isn't it yeah um because it's just quite simple like Mm. it doesn't need to be more complicated than that and I wish that we could yeah have a simpler conversation around it in some ways and as I said I think one of the challenges is in the world of fast news, 24 hours news that we have today, clickbaity headlines, whether that's online, whether that's on social media, are fundamentally a lot more interesting than PR in carrots. And yeah. so a lot of that, try Meat Free Monday, try adding one extra portion of fruit or veg to your meals each mm-hmm. day, which would have a massive impact over time. Actually, it gets very, very lost. It does. Um, but I certainly went through a phase of saying, oh, I don't really want to say anything anymore for fear of saying the wrong thing. And actually, I think now I just I'm like, it's OK. You know, I really believe in in yeah. a plant rich approach, as you said, like the amount of evidence Ella, to not show veganism. And I think the confusion is the term plant based. You know, plant based just means reduce animal produce and eat more plants. It doesn't mean you have to go vegan. And perhaps a lot of the confusion for you that you're getting from your audiences are they assume that means 100 percent vegan plant based. But I think it speaks to the kind of diet culture that we have in mm-hmm. this very, I think for me, what I've I've come to it's like it's my number one frustration it and again it comes back to this idea of lack of nuance but it's this very entrenched diet culture that we have and I think maybe particularly of people around our age where you grew up and all around was Atkins diet the Dukan diet the South Beach diet (laughs) you name it sort of thing and it's this very um on a bandwagon off a bandwagon and it was all like what's X, Y, Z celebrity in Hollywood doing and it was just this very kind of um it's toxic yeah it's very fundamentally unhealthy but it's Mm. also this like it's really unhelpful way of looking at food because it's for the next six weeks do x y or z and you know 
I, I hope he wouldn't mind me saying it, but like my dad did all of those diets. And I remember watching do, him doing them all growing up. And he would go on the diet for a period of time, lose a lot of weight. It looked so sad and miserable because it was so strict and, you know, to the letter of what the diet told you to do. And then he would stop the diet and go back to eating exactly the same way as he ate before, put the weight back on and six months later do the same thing. And it just, it was just, and, you know, and I know so many women as well, you know, I say women just because that's the core of our audience and they'll get in touch and say like that kind of diet, yo-yoing and people so, so stuck in it and don't know how to get out of it. And it creates this really fearful approach around food. Um, But I think it's one of the biggest challenges that we have in terms of moving people towards eating a healthier diet is trying to say a healthier diet isn't a diet in the way we think of these conventional diets. You don't have to say, I will only cook from this cookbook. I will only do this. I will only do that. You can say, I am going to try and put more of these healthful foods on my plate. That doesn't mean I can't go out with my girlfriends Mm. and, you know, have a great night and drink loads of margaritas. Like, I think we have this mentality. If you do that, then say, oh, we'll chuck the good work out the door. It's not worth anything anymore. (laughs) You know, I quit. And actually, it's... It's not good for our self-esteem. It's not good for our mental well-being. And ultimately, it doesn't help us eat well. No. And so I think that's, if I, if anyone listening take anything from this, it would be this real kind of urge to help move everyone towards this like genuine sense of, of balance where like you can absolutely batch cook something healthy on the weekend and use it as your lunches when you're going into the office because it's cheaper, it's healthier, it will stop you getting the afternoon slump. Um, save don't, money it's just the exactly it save you money that's I think that's such a big thing for people listening at the moment is that they are really scrapped for cash and it's it's a hard time of year it's winter and everything seems to be going up and what you've just said is that all this money spent on fad diets yo-yo dieting you mentioned women as well let's go there for a second I feel like you are one of the leading founders in terms of being a female owning, running a business. Obviously, I know that Matt is incredible. We love Matt. You know, he's playing a huge role. But you are also a huge inspiration to so many women, including myself. I know how hard it is balancing motherhood, balancing a business. And yet we also have additional challenges that the data and the research we have in the healthcare system is only just starting to materialize with hormonal fluctuations, menopause. Um, You know, I didn't have a module at uni on nutrition for menstruation. It's additional work I've had to do. So how do you feel as a female founder navigating a space this big? You know, you're conquering America. You've just got your own factory. Do you feel that there are boundaries being a female? Do you ever feel that you have to compensate somewhere or you're fighting for this space? Yeah, it's a great question. I think I felt it a lot, a lot, a lot. We talked earlier about imposter syndrome and I felt that so much early on. Um, a really extraordinary degree and you know we raised money in 2017 we then bought out the investors in 2021 Mm. um but you know i remember when we were meeting with investors i don't think there was ever another woman around the table yeah and that was a really interesting moment and because obviously i co-owned the business with my husband i found they were literally only speaking to him wow and it was you know say oh let's go and play golf and talk about it and yeah, like, it was hello. really. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, it was really, it was really interesting, and it, but it, re- I found, I found it really hit my confidence a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, re- it massively did actually, and yes, I've noticed. I think I, it, it feel a lot more comfortable about it now, but it's that's taken a long, long time, and I think I've had to have this like consistent, almost like evidence sheet of what we've done in the business and what we've achieved to be able to say like oh no I am actually an entrepreneur I am a business owner because actually that yeah that's that's taken like a solid decade to be able to say that hearing you say that actually really emotional um but I think also like I remember after years and years and we say had like 40 people that we employed and you know the business was doing really well and you know in all the major supermarkets and being like blogger I was like I don't actually have a blog anymore and there's nothing wrong with being a blogger. It's a great career. 
but it was like I don't think if I was a man they would and I started that. a business and I employed 40 people and it was officially a medium sized business like multi-million pound turnover I don't think you would call me a blogger and again as I said there is nothing to dismiss that as a career but that definitely I didn't have a blog <laughs> I hadn't had for years no. it definitely wasn't my job yeah. and um, and so I find that quite quite interesting and I think people it's condescending yeah I think that's I don't know why it's the only thing that it still sometimes <laughs> really, really winds me yes. up. Um, just because, I think because of the amount of work and the amount of sacrifice and the amount of compromises it takes you to own a factory now, Ella. Yeah, get a business off the ground. Yeah. And and it never ends. Like it, right. it's, it's bigger and it's more stable, but the amount of, the extent to which it takes over your life never changes. Um, and I, I do think, and, and again, it's it's a really challenging conversation. And I, you know, it's I think the we people who say was anti-feminist, but like ultimately, and every single woman I speak to would say, I think it says the exact same thing. Like combining your work and motherhood is incredibly difficult. And I have the most amazing husband. He is so supportive. He is so brilliant. But like he wasn't breastfeeding. No. He didn't give birth. He wasn't pregnant. Yeah. It's ultimately like it is different. Yeah. Um, and... I think sometimes like people don't want to say it is different, but certainly in my experience, we had two very different experiences of it. And yeah, trying to be back at work, as you were saying, with the level of hormonal fluctuations, the changes so in your body, on. the challenges mentally. And I really struggled mentally, especially after Sky, my older daughter was born. And then you're at work and you're trying to show up for people and you know, you can't, there's a level to which you can't be vulnerable because obviously there's, you know, many, many people that count on you, you know, to pay them every month. And you can't, you know, you've got to, when things are bad, you've got to be the person that's like, that's okay, we'll fix it. This This is what we're going to do. And that relentless pulling rabbits out of a hat is exhausting. Mm. And then when you're also up all night and you've got this going on, that going on, you've been in A&E and you're still, but you've still got to do that same job with no difference to how Mm -hmm. it was before fundamentally. Um, And maybe perhaps the feminist angle there as well is that you, because you are doing these different jobs, let's be honest, um, motherhood is also a full-time job. It's relentless. You cannot just wake up later one morning or if you're poorly, take a day off because you're still a mother. Um, The vulnerability that you have with those hormonal fluctuations, you are having to hide. And I feel that in suppressing a part of yourself because you have to maintain this front to almost keep up in a male-dominated environment because otherwise they would not take you seriously. You know, you, you can't have a nipple leak in a meeting and in front of a group of men sat at the table. You know, would they look at you and think, what is she doing here? But you have every right to be there and you have every right to be doing the job as a mother. So it's a, I don't know what the answer is with this, but it's a difficult world to navigate. And I feel like perhaps our generation are at the forefront of doing it. No, absolutely. And I think the openness of the conversation is amazing. But equally, I'm really conscious that I think and I read a really good piece over Christmas about this in the Times um, by a female journalist who was saying like we're almost now making motherhood look so awful oh I saw our, that yes. yeah it was I really it. it was really brilliant and it's this really interesting again it comes yeah. back to nuance I keep saying the same thing but it's it's that because I think our generation are now able to talk about it in a more open way without making it sound it so sound terrible horrendous. and certainly that's not how we feel like being a being a parent yeah. has been the most empowering extraordinary experience I've had and I think I'm a better person for it I think it's rounded me out in a really important way um and it's not for everyone but for me that's certainly been the experience um so I don't want to be like it's impossible I prefer I prefer it as it is now but equally that balance trying to you can't find the balance and, and I really don't believe you can have it all and again that's not something that I know everyone always wants to hear and I don't want to be really depressing about it but I do think there is this like in the sort of social media world that we live on we we feel like we can be anything and do anything and there's so much about that that I love but I think it so often misses the reality which is that ultimately yeah when you've got small children when you've got a very demanding career I have and I'll be the first person to say it like absolutely zero life outside I have of no that. social life either yeah. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah. Like I feel really fulfilled and I you know, again, life is a series of choices, mm-hmm. isn't it? And I have chosen to focus on parenting and my career and I don't want to make any compromises with either of those. And as a result there's not really space for anything else. But it 
I think it's right to be honest about the fact that literally everything else has fallen by the wayside. Yeah, and and it's actually really refreshing to have those conversations. I remember seeing an analogy of all these different cups and it was social life, work, family life, me time. It's not physically possible to have a level um, in all of those cups, a level glass of water, for instance, in all of those cups. Something has to be lower than the other. Um, Delicious Liella, though, is going to America in America. Please fill me in, update me, because this is insanely amazing yeah it's really exciting so we actually tried well we tried to we were about this is take three so the first (laughs) time we we went out to the US and um, we were invited by a retailer to go out and and to kind of show all our products and everything and that went really well and we came back and I took a pregnancy test the next day. Uh, we're like, yeah. okay, there we go. let's <laughs> maybe not go to America today. We're going to have a baby instead. And the business was just too early. Like it, that was, the juggle was not going to be yeah. feasible at that point. And I think we had to be really honest about that. And obviously having That's a That's a hard baby, discussion to have as well at the time, I can imagine. Do you know what? It was really easy. Yeah? Yeah. Interestingly, it was one of those conversations where we just like didn't even think about it. I love that. It was like um, fate for you. Just, yeah. That's our fate. It was yeah. definitely the right thing. And then we were about to launch and we printed all our packaging. I think we were two weeks away from our first production run and then COVID happened. Um, So we had to make, that was a difficult decision because I can't remember how much it was, but like tens of thousands of pounds worth of packaging. Um, And we, but obviously it was so unclear what was going to happen. This was in March, 2020. Mm. And, you know, everyone's saying, oh, it's going to be two weeks. And I remember Matthew and I looking at each other and being like, it's not going to be two weeks. This looks bad. Although not realising it was going to be yeah. as long as it was going to be. Um, and America obviously closed its borders and everything. So we made the decision to write off that packaging and, and not launch because yeah. it just felt like a mad thing to do when you had no idea if you could even get into the country. You made the right decision, obviously, yeah. but the money and the loss of those... Yeah, and there was such, just the frustration when you've worked so hard. Yeah. So we were about to launch in Germany as well. We just hired someone. She was on her like second week and she'd been hired to, to launch Germany. <laughs> she, anyway, she's amazing and she, she actually, she's like one of the best people we have in the team and it's all well that ends Good. well. But it was, um, so none of that happened. Um, and But we have now, finally, um, many years later, almost five years after we were first thinking about it, launched in the US. Um, but definitely, actually, our plan is to do the US slowly yeah. and probably more carefully than I think we were going to do earlier on, which I think in the long run is actually definitely the right thing. But it is really exciting. We're now shipping to 40 countries around the world, which oh, is really um, amazing. Yeah, it's 40. really 40. I couldn't so, even list. I probably, no, I don't embarrass myself. Could I list 40 countries right now? Probably, I hope so. <laughs> um, which is, yeah, which is really exciting. And we've got yeah, a team member living over. Um, she's in Brooklyn. And um, yeah, starting that off, which is amazing. And does it help inspire, I guess, the family life obviously helped inspire. I'm assuming this is a big drive for you with um, Healthy Made Simple as yeah. a family and, you know, recipes that you can get the kids involved with as well. And is that the same with the business and the books now? Yeah, it really is. I don't know how you found it when your kids were born. And I wrote this in the book as well. Like, I, And to anyone listening, I don't think this happens like exclusively when you have children. I think there's lots of reasons why that would be yeah. the case. But I think you have this... Sometimes you have this crunch in life where suddenly like everything kind of compresses inwards and you're like, oh my God, I don't have time for anything. And it it happens, I think, inevitably when you have children, but it may also be like caring for elderly parents. There's all sorts of reasons why it might be the case. Um, you know, studying while working, etc. Yeah. But there's just this sudden moment where you need more energy than ever, but you have no time. Yeah. And it's not like my recipes were always focused on like really complicated things. It's always been simple cooking. It's always been every day. And I've always known that's how people use Delicious Yellow as well. It's never been, we're not where people come on a Saturday evening. No, it's on the app, isn't it? Exactly. It's so easy to use the app. And, and it's all those there. like 20 minutes, it's yeah. stir fries. It's... I love the stir fries. The one in here, the ginger and chilli one, that's really good. Yeah, and those are, that's, those are the recipes that people cook of ours. Yeah. Like we've seen that time and time again. Yeah, it's they're like the solid favourite. Toasty, it's tray bakes, it's one pan meals. Your green pastas, I love your green pastas. All of that. They inspire me with my green pasta. Exactly. It. It's it. like the easy way to get your veggies yeah. in and things like that. And that's what people want from us. But I think what I realised at that point was like, even then, it was too complicated and everything had to strip back. And it was trying to find this compromise between, I really, really believe in food tasting good. Like obviously, you know, clues in the title is called Deliciously. But I just, 
I think some people aren't that interested in food and I definitely know a few people like that, but most people really enjoy food. And so it has to be satisfying. And that comes obviously from both flavor and texture. And so how do you get that balance between actually being satisfying so you're not then craving loads of other food afterwards, which I think you are if you're eating like a sad little bowl of lettuce. Um, I lo- I hate the worst thing in the world. It says, do you find you get stereotyped with that, even though people see that you are deliciously yellow with creative meals? I get it all the time as a nutritionist. Sad bowls of lettuce. I don't want to hold another bowl of lettuce. I also hate lettuce. Which yeah. Is so- and, and also, there's no <laughs> nutrient. There's just no benefits to eating lettuce. You're far better off having some uh, um, cabbage. But what is, <laughs> yeah, and it, I really just don't. Yeah, I'm not a lettuce scout, but it was this, how do I create this balance between something that is genuinely satisfying? And I found myself like in those early days like just ordering way too many takeaways and eating toast way too much of the time because I was just so exhausted and I just was like I cannot be bothered but then what I found was I felt worse than you know my energy levels were worse I was sleeping worse I just felt bloated like I didn't I didn't feel great and so I I didn't relearn how to cook but there's an element of relearning the way that I was thinking about my meals of like actually there is that sweet spot between kind of effort and reward and I guess that's what this book's about it's all the sorts of things that I make at home that like genuinely feel plausible on a Tuesday night and like really conscious of those Amazon reviewers out there had I wrote in there like it's not about Michelin star food like this isn't trying to be the most crazy thing you've ever done this is trying to be realistic Mm. for people's actual needs which is you want to take care of yourself you want to eat more veggies and it's a Monday and you have a full-time job and you have other responsibilities or things that you do in your life and you do not have loads of time and you do not have loads of energy to do it. And also the ingredients list are really simple. They're all under 10 ingredients, but they're also, you know, there's like the nichest things in there is miso and harissa. That's it. And you're going to use them in loads and loads of recipes, so you wouldn't need to worry about exactly. it. Exactly. And once you buy one pack of miso, you know, it goes so far. So exactly. So people realise. But you mentioned Amazon reviewers. Do you still, just at this stage in your career, because I'm interested because nobody likes being um, subject to not constructive criticism. We like constructive, but there's always that element. Do you, when you release a book, because you're on number seven, this is number seven, isn't it? Number seven, yeah. Lucky number, number seven. seven. Lucky number Lucky seven. Lucky number seven. Beautiful number seven. The girls are gorgeous and everything looks fantastic, but you still get nervous. Oh my reviews. God, yes, so nervous. nervous. There you go. <laughs> yeah, still get nervous. No, no, definitely get nervous. Yeah, because yeah. that's we've got a few questions from our listeners and I think... Um, I mean, this was bound to come up. Every, nearly every question was, how on earth do you balance being a mother and having a business? So uh, I think we've kind of touched on that. But do you know what? I'll give you one other thing a, on that. Give us I'll give you one other thing. The best thing that I started to do is I get up before the girls. Really? That is the best thing that I do. Oh, I need motivation to do that, Ella. Um, <laughs> yeah, it is. it means being quite disciplined and going to bed. How I early is that? Like 5.30. Oh so it is early. Yeah, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's early but I go to bed at about 9.30 so and can you sw- are you quite good at just going right I'm going to bed and you can fall asleep now I try and I, look don't get me wrong I go in periods of it like I was in a really bad period before Christmas of working till like 10, 11 yeah, at yeah. night and so 100% like I am not perfect by any means and so it is like a daily-ish intention yeah, yeah, yeah. not and I obviously am not going to if I go to bed at 11 having been working all night I'm not going to set an alarm for 5 that's really silly um, but generally, I'd say like two thirds of the time, let's okay. say that is what I do. And it does make the world of difference because it's the only time of calm in the day because no one wants anything from, from you. you. And I think that is the most bit difficult bit is almost like being grabbed at all day. Yeah. And so I, I meditate and I really believe for me in a daily meditation practice, it's sometimes it's just five minutes, yeah. sometimes up to 15 minutes. But that creates a sense of calm and presence and groundedness that is like so important for me do you still do your yoga because i went to one of your classes ages i think i was pregnant then yeah yeah i was at the back i'll often do like a 15 minute yeah class i might make coffee and just drink it quietly listen to music um but it's just a moment of like whatever i need for myself i really try and be super disciplined not to look at instagram go on my phone because suddenly you've got up early and the whole 45 minutes has gone all you've done is learn about taylor swift's like (laughs) latest concert yeah whatever's going on with her boyfriend (laughs) and whatever your friend's cousin's cat's doing um but that is the best thing that i do is try and find a moment 
for myself because otherwise my overwhelm spirals really quickly okay I don't normally set resolutions for myself but I think I'm going to try and do the wake up early I mean I'm I am lucky mine don't wake up till people are going to hate me seven so I could easily get up at half six before them and even have 30 minutes exactly and you can make a cup of tea cup of coffee whatever it is do five minutes of breathing 10 minutes of stretching and I think it is this again I think it speaks to what we were just saying about this like balance between ease and nutrition and convenience and all the rest of it which is like I think I used to think oh is there any point in doing five minutes and oh my gosh you feel the point of five minutes and it's so easy to again it's that perfect enemy of good thing it's like no you don't have an hour to go to the gym No. no you don't have an hour to cook this but you do have five minutes to make a smoothie you do have five minutes to do a breathing exercise you do have 15 minutes to make a very easy stir fry like you were saying that chili and, and the ginger pastas one. i will say with my kids especially they're the quickest things and they love standing there watching all you have to do is just, just so easy it's exactly so easy, or you like pastas. batch make something yeah so every weekend i batch make the shortcut bolognese it's nice. so straightforward it's packed with plant protein it, my and iron because it. you've got lentils and when you've got lentils paired with tomatoes you've got iron absorption so I think your rest anyway so anyway so that the yeah just like reminding yourself that five minutes makes a yeah. really big difference when you don't have any time and it is worth doing five minutes of stretching five minutes yeah. of breathing a super quick recipe and also just trying to carve out a second yeah. for yourself I love that that's kind do you know what I think we're going to stick at that for listener questions because nearly all of them are a lot of them want to know what you personally take as supplements. Um, and I do think we've got to be a bit wary here, obviously, because, you know, what works for Ella, as we quite rightly said at the beginning, may not work for you. Um, so I'm not so sure that we should actually delve into that one. I don't know if you want to share supplement ratios. No, I know or... what you mean. It's people often say like, oh, do what you eat in a day. I'm like, that yeah. feels really um, unhelpful. Yeah nowadays because ultimately like my day is different to your day is different to someone else's day my needs different to your needs to someone else's needs depending what although I will be getting up early now in the Um, morning the same time as Ella (laughs) but um but yeah obviously because I have a plant-based diet I take um, vitamin b12 I obviously take vitamin d in the winter and all the rest of it I take an omega-3 yeah yeah, your, your usuals. Yeah, exactly. All the usuals you need on a plant-based diet. Um, and then the one question I think is helpful that we'll do from Ruth. So thank you, Ruth, because it is important. What are the first steps if you're transitioning into something new like a plant-based diet? Because you were there, Ella, back in the day. And if we do rewind the clock, you've been there starting from scratch. What are Give us top three tips to transitioning. I would say whatever you're doing, whether it's a plant-based diet or making any changes in your life, especially when it comes to your habits and your health, the first thing is like start really slowly. And I Mm. think that's really the antidote to what a lot of people do. And I I caveat that with, I know I've been open about the fact I changed everything at once, but I was in a quite different place because I was really unwell and I really needed to make probably a more drastic change. But if you're like, I want more energy, I want to look after myself, I want to feel less lethargic, bloated, whatever it is, I just know I need to eat a bit better. Start slowly because it's about, as we said earlier, like think about yourself 365 days from today. Like just spend a second and just picture yourself this time exactly next year and where you'd like to be you have a long time to get there a long long time to get there you know I love this idea of being one percent closer to your goal every day if you actually moved one percent closer every single day across that year you're getting 365 yeah, in the full circle exactly you're getting way over where you're trying to be but it's so manageable it's this idea of distilling those goals down and I think that really speaks to like doing it slowly doing it gently so you want to feel healthier, right? Maybe you want more energy to run around after your kids, to get more from work, to get more from your life, to have more to give to other people. You know, maybe, you, yeah, you just want to lose a little bit of weight. You want to feel good in yourself again. That's great. There's nothing wrong with any of these goals. But if what you're trying to do is achieve it by next week, yeah. you're not, you're going to have a quite a challenging time. Whereas if you give yourself 365 days or twice that, three times that, you can do it in a way that's like, right, what's the one thing that I can do today? And ask yourself that right now. Think, okay, I have 24 hours in today. It's probably a really busy 24 hours, but I bet I can do one thing for myself. And maybe that one thing is I actually am going to sit down now and say, I'm going to make this for dinner and I'm going to get those ingredients on the way home. Maybe you're going to do a five minute meditation when you get home because you've had a really intense day. Maybe you're going to run a bath and listen to a podcast in the bath and take a second for yourself. Maybe you're going to like prep your porridge overnight ready for tomorrow. These things are when you actually break that down, those all feel really, really manageable. And so just think to yourself every day, what's the one thing I'm going to do today to move closer to my goal? And that works 
both personally, as we were saying, for health goals, but also on a professional level mm. as well. Like just to sell everything down, to be 1% closer every single day. And I think you will be so shocked at the levels of which you move. And I think oh, we go. so overestimate what we can achieve in a day, a week, a month. And we so underestimate what we can achieve in a year, but particularly in a decade. Wow, yeah. And the, you know, you can't believe you got from A to B, but you got from A to B by the, really when you do move from A to B I believe it's because most of the time you've done it brick by brick layer by layer so I think that would be my first thing I think the second thing it is this don't let perfect be the enemy of good like it doesn't have to be perfect every day you might have set that goal and you're going to go on holiday for a week and you're going to completely ignore that goal and that is not a bad thing that doesn't mean you have to give up on it altogether like you're not 100% committed to anything at any time. A little bit is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is just like bring that compassion to it, bring that like longevity to it and keep thinking like, no, I just want to get there in time. You know, this is a, a long-term approach and and don't think it's not worth doing anything because I can't do everything. Um, no one can do everything. So to stop letting perfect mean you don't start. And I think the third thing is though, like fundamentally, so much of life is out of our control but there's a lot that's in our control and ultimately like if you want something in your life start today there is always a reason not to do something and there will always be a hundred different excuses or things that we can tell ourselves of why today is not the right day but most of the time it's it's not necessarily the case like there is no better time to start something today and start small start gently start slowly but just start so if you're listening to this and you're like no this year I do want to make a change I don't want to do that anymore I want to become this person like I want to make this change do one thing today that moves you closer to it and stop putting it off because ultimately you'll never start otherwise because there will always 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 be a reason to not do it and the only certainty in life is uncertainty we don't know what's going to happen mm. even 20 minutes from now mm -hmm. and so you know there is no crystal ball and so there's no reason nothing to tell you that tomorrow is going to be a better day it's the same with business guys i'm sure you get that question all the time just start if you don't start you'll never know you just have to start and you have to start with the most open mind like ultimately things will change it will pivot that's the right thing and you but you don't know anything until you give it a go. Exactly, Alan. No, I couldn't agree more. Brick by brick. And also it prevents nutritional deficiencies and it helps your digestion get accustomed to things. So brick by brick is a really good way of adopting change. Thank you. That was so good. Um, fact or fiction round, Ella? OK, I'm ready. <laughs> She's ready. OK, here we go. Following a plant-based diet is boring. No, definitely not. <laughs> Although it can be. Okay, yeah, it can be if you don't cook Ella's recipes. Um, <laughs> it's possible to get sufficient protein on a plant-based diet. Yes. Plant-based cooking always requires expensive ingredients. No, that is literally the biggest myth. It's actually proven that plant-based cooking is cheaper. It's annoying, that myth. I understand it, though, but mm. I... Because it's, again, it's not... I'm giving a long answer to a short That's round, good, but it's it? this idea that, again, because I think a lot of wellness headlines are linked to clickbaity type things, they're linked to, like complicated powders and all the rest of it whereas actually like when you're rooting the diet in carrots in lentils in chickpeas in potatoes you know in brown rice you don't these aren't expensive ingredients guys you don't need green powders to be healthy um you have to be good at cooking to cook tasty plant-based meals no and i wish that people could find more confidence like when people say i'm not a good cook yeah. now i'm not talking about like you know very complicated patisserie like that is a that is a massive skill. Can and you do patisserie? Oh, it's like my worst nightmare. I was say, oh I my god, not my like. I I'm not really a big baker, but I but my do you get pancakes. I do make and I make a pancakes every single weekend. Um, but the one thing I'd say about like simple every single day cooking is like you can't really get it wrong. You know, if you're making say like. I don't know, a stew or a curry or a stir fry, you can add more stuff to it. You know, you get to the end and I'll do this too. I bet you do it. And you're like, nah, it's a bit bland. You can add miso, you can add pesto, you can add ginger, you can add chili, like add stuff to it. So uh, you can't get it that wrong. Baking, you can get wrong and I get that. But simple everyday tray bakes, one pot meals, stir fries, you can't get them that wrong. So have confidence in that. Love that. Um, you have to take supplements when following a vegan diet. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, including more plant-based meals in the diet is beneficial for the gut. Yes. Um, most children won't enjoy plant-based meals. Such an interesting one. And I don't I want to yes or no it because one of the things I've become so conscious of, people say this to me all the time, it's like, do your children really eat that? No, I guess. Okay. And the thing is, is like, 
that's all my children know. Like mm -hmm. then, you know, their number one meal that they eat is a variation. I always call it bolognese to them, but it's like curry stews, bolognese. It's like all my leftover veg with a mix of tin tomatoes, beans, mashed up tofu, coconut milk, pestos. I love tofu. Yeah, love us it. too. So whatever, it's a, all sorts of sometimes, but peanut butter and it's like a hundred variations on like basically chucking in loads of veggies in there but that is what they're used to eating so they don't find that weird um i totally understand if you've never eaten anything like that then your children might not enjoy it so but again it's that brick by brick approach you could try by taking your normal bolognese and doing half your traditional mm -hmm. meat and half lentils and that would be an easy way or adding one extra vegetable that you don't normally put in into it so there are ways of kind of balancing it out i think if you've if your children don't eat lots of vegetables and you present them with a plate of boiled broccoli, they will think that is boring. Yeah, of course. Totally. <laughs> I think you answered that perfectly balanced. And of course, the younger you can start, if you're able to, with your children's nutrition and health, it's obviously going to be um, beneficial. Plant-based cooking requires specialised and hard-to-find ingredients. No, it really doesn't. And actually, with the book, we had a rule in the office that... Um, when Give we... me the office gossip. I don't get any of that. <laughs> yeah, it's not that juicy. What was the rule? But no, the rule was we have, it is quite a big Sainsbury's local, but it's the Sainsbury's local right opposite us. Yeah. And if the ingredient wasn't in the Sainsbury's local, it couldn't be used in the book. I like yeah. that. So it's, it is a big local. Like it's not one of the really small ones. No. It's the kind of medium, you know, it's a large yeah. local. Um, but it's, if it wasn't in there, mm-mm. Right, that's, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, Plant-based chocolate contains additives, preservatives and emulsifiers to taste the same as normal chocolate. Doesn't need to, is the answer. No, I can say my boys only eat Ella's chocolate. They love it. Um, being healthy really can be simple. It really, really can. And I think if, again, like that would be such a nice thing for people to take from this, that it is these five minute things. It is these stir fries. It is a tray bake. It is taking a bath with a podcast it is going for a walk or doing like a 10 minute stretch at home that is what true i actually believe that's what true health is because i think true health is sustainable health and that is the sort of healthy habits that almost anybody can take up today and keep doing most days most weeks for the rest of their life and that is simplicity once you talk about complicated things the reality is life will get in the way and those habits won't last so they may have loads of benefits to them but if they're not sustainable, ultimately, they're not going to be that impactful. Sure, that's a lovely place to finish. And it's almost like you've just done the food for thought for us, the take home message at the end, because what you've said makes, well, it does make sense. And it's not going to make the headlines do it brick by brick, is it? Let's be honest. No, so and that's the thing. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know, it's it's frustrating. We Actually, we've just been away for a few weeks and my husband and I talked about it a lot. It's the same with our business. Like we yeah. chose to buy our investors. We haven't taken any in, in external money. And so we have built our business brick by brick. It's taken us, you know, best part of 10 years to get to where it is today. And we're super proud of where it is today. But you see other businesses, they raise loads and loads of money. They get much bigger. And now actually lots of them have gone bust. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so lots of them haven't, but they still have never turned a profit and all the rest of it. And I think we have just like lost sight of the, Brick by brick is not a bad thing. Like sustainable isn't a bad thing. And we so love quick fixes. We love it's that kind of like boom or bust mentality. It's kind of seeped into our whole culture. And there's nothing wrong with doing things just bit by bit by bit. Because I I really believe that more times than not, that is what will move you from A to B and keep you at B and maybe get you to C and D and E as opposed to just actually going back to where you started. Really resonated with me with just to kind of finish on the fact that I think we are a culture of quick fixes and we want things now and it's damaged our planet, it's damaged our health. Um, and our mental health within that so much health. because we have this idea that everything will be how we want it to be tomorrow and life doesn't really work like that. No, it's not fair. And equally, it's not fair on us to have these expectations that are not real for ourselves. So on a positive note, Ella books out january 4th so everyone can go and get it now yeah Yay. yeah 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 honestly and if you do like this is these are all the recipes i make at home like they really are easy they really are delicious they really are things that you can make after work and they have to read the beginning because at the beginning you write your um the why behind the book and you give some really good tips and you've got a from me to you section which is really lovely at the start and for a lot of people um, listening as well do you have more things in the pipeline that you can share or is it now just let's focus on the here and now yeah this year is a bit more here and now actually nice. last year was a year of like 1000 things firing on all cylinders at all times and and this year we i mean we have just bought a factory so that is quite a big 
project. It's a huge project. We've got a big book tour going on, and so that's a that's a big project. But um, it's a yeah, and we've launched America, and yeah, so you you say that, but actually the book tour is big. I'm coming to see you in Amersham now. My friend booked ticket. I was like, oh, I'm going to come with you. Oh, I can't wait. So her book tour is UK wide book tour. Yeah, UK wide. Yeah. Um, So no, so lots going on, but it is yeah. I this year my resolution is just to enjoy the present as much as possible and that is my number one goal there you go ella thank you for coming on food thank you